Hey friend, Graham here from recordingrevolution.com. Hope you're having a very musical week. I want to break down just a couple of mistakes, three actually, that a lot of people make with their DAW, their digital audio workstation, uh, aka their recording and mixing software. All of us use some kind of software these days to record our mix. I'm in Pro Tools. It could be Logic. It could be Cubase, Studio One, Ableton. The list goes on, right? I don't really care which platform you use. These mistakes aren't platform specific. It's more of how we use these tools. If you're working in the digital domain, uh, then these mistakes should be avoided and they happen a lot. So I, I get to interact with so many of you every single week. So I get to hear a lot of what you're doing and see how you guys are working in um, in your setups. And a lot of newer mixers and engineers are kind of getting these wrong. So maybe this will help you out if you're newer to the recording and mixing in the digital domain uh, landscape, or just if you're a wily old veteran and you want a good refresher. Uh, mistake number one is not gain staging individual tracks down to their sweet spot. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> it simply means this, and this is a real thing, by the way. People seem to think that gain staging is not important in the digital domain. It really is still. Um, it's all about getting the right level or gain at every stage of the recording and mixing process. I'm just going to talk about mixing right now, assuming that you've already recorded it and it's too late. But if you pay attention to this one mistake, you'll realize how you can backwards apply it to the recording phase. Um, I got a track here that I did not record, was given to me. Um, and when I get tracks from a client, they're I don't know what the levels are. They could be all over the place. Um, and what I want to do is show you that not all tracks should be at the level you're given. A lot of times you got tracks that are just way too hot. And this is a, a real problem in the sense that there is a, a level at which individual tracks sound their best when going through a lot of plugins. For example, I've got an SSL channel strip plugin here from Waves, one of my go tos. It's a great plugin. This plugin emulates as best as it can the analog components of a channel on an SSL 9000, I think, board. Um, and this is the E, e channel in particular. When they code these plugins, they they code them in such a way that the signal flow represents the analog counterpart as well, best as it can. And they have coded it. So there is a sweet spot, the, the ideal target that you want to run audio through this level-wise. And this plugin in particular, I think, is minus 16 dB. Um, and that is average volume. Okay, not peak volume, but average volume. And it, it's any, usually between minus 16 to minus 18. You can look up the manual. And if you're an SSL owner, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong on the actual Waves manual on this. I think it's around minus 16, but it's definitely in that ballpark as the sweet spot of where this plugin is coded to sound its best. So all that means for you is if you have any kind of plugin that emulates any analog counterpart, whether it's a compressor or an EQ or a channel strip, which is all of those combined, figure out what the sweet spot is, but I can give you a shortcut. It's probably around minus 18 dB. That's usually where a lot of these plugins sound their best. And so that means you want the actual track that you put that plugin on to have an average volume of minus 18 dB. I am not that technical. You could grab an RMS meter. RMS measures average volume as opposed to peak volume. Or you can just use Graham's little rule of thumb, which is look at the um, actual audio wave as it's peaking on the meter and see where it's peaking. You don't want it to peak any higher than 75% of the way up the meter. If you look closely, this track I have pulled down by minus 2.8 dB, meaning its actual volume was here. It's a bit bigger. And when I look at um, the meter here, let's get rid of the plug-in. Let's take a look at what the meter's looking at. So that actually is not bad. It looks like I pulled it down just a little bit to be on the more conservative side. That's actually not a bad spot to be, minus 2.8, I think. And what I do is I go through each track and I make sure that they're not too loud. For example, this synth here, I pulled down minus seven and a half. So let's put it up back to all the volume that it came to me as. And 
And I felt it was peaking closer to 80, you know, 80% of the way up the meter. So I just pulled it down to seven and a half, seven and a half dB. So it's pretty conservative. 50% to 75% of the way up the meter is where I like things to peak. So to me, that was a better spot for its average volume. So I go through every track individually, and if it's too quiet, I'll turn it up. If it's too loud, I'll turn it down on the clip level, not on the faders, because this doesn't affect signal going into plugins. This only affects the signal after the plugins. Okay, that's important in our next mistake, but the first one is not gain staging properly, not turning down really loud tracks, and most home studio tracks are recorded too loud. There's a reason, A, one of the reasons why a lot of Home, home mixes sound bad is the tracks were recorded way too loud and then they're running through a plug-in too hot so it's not sounding its optimal level it just doesn't sound as good it's just the way the plugins were coded so pull the tracks down on the clip level with clip based gain if you don't have something like this on the actual audio track you can use some kind of uh gain plugin or trim plugin in pro tools there's one called trim and it gives you you know a fader that you can use right here in the inserts so that it'll turn the actual track down by whatever you want before the other plugins. Or maybe you have a, um, a console, you know, plugin or a mix tool plugin. I think Studio One has a mix tool plugin that has a gain, a gain plugin, anything like that. You can do it on a plugin level. You would just insert that before all your other plugins. And that would really help. You can also do it on the input like here on the SSL, there actually is an input uh, knob. So actually, you can actually turn the input down. This would affect the level before the plugin. Uh, but if you don't have something like that, it's best to just control it um, you know, on the actual audio clip itself. If you do that for every track, you will have better sounding tracks because when they hit their plugins, they will be sitting at the sweet spot, the digital sweet spot. So that's mistake number one, is they don't gain stage down uh, their individual tracks. So hopefully you will no longer make that mistake if you're doing it. Mistake number two is taking that a step further and sending too hot of a signal to your mix bus. Okay, your mix bus is your master fader, your two bus, depending on how you call it or where you were raised or how you were trained. It's the it's the final stereo track that all your tracks dump to. And like in my case, I have plugins on it and all that stuff. But what you want to do is make sure the mistake is letting this run too hot Clipping is awful, but still, you don't want it to run too hot. You really want, even after your plugins, you want your master fader to peak, you know, at like minus five, minus six. You want to leave five to six dB of headroom on the peak. So this is no longer average volume that I'm looking at right now. I'm not really worried about that because it's going to be louder in mastering. So it's already going to be pretty quiet, but I'm looking at peak volume. I want to leave some headroom for the mastering engineer, or if I'm going to master it, I want to leave headroom there as well. So let's take a look at where this mix is hitting right now. Right, so this is peaking at minus five, maybe hit minus four in the hook, where it was a little bit louder. That's on the high end of where I'd want it. I for sure wouldn't want it to be any louder. If I feel like it's getting too loud, I can pull the master fader down uh, and then we'll be good to go. And because that's all after the plugins in the way I've got it routed here. But what this will do is give you a ballpark of what to shoot for in terms of your overall volume. When you're setting your faders here and creating a balance, you want to make sure that they aren't creating a mix that's any louder than minus five, minus six dB for peak, right? So, you know, the, the average volume will be quieter, but the loudest peaks should be around that minus five range. That will give you some headroom when it goes to mastering. So big mistake there is having a mix way, way up at the top. Don't let that happen anymore. Make sure there's plenty of headroom. And again, we're looking at peak. If it peaks around minus five, you're totally good to go. Third and final mistake I see a lot of newer mixers making in their DAWs, and this is a controversial one, is recording and, and mixing at super, super high sample rates. Now, it's not a mistake in the sense that go ahead and do whatever you want, okay? Do whatever you want. Like, for example, if I'm looking at uh, this session here, this session is 
at 44.1 kilohertz is the sample rate, right? I'm not really talking about bit depth right now. You should probably always be recording and mixing at 24 bits, just more headroom. It's just easier. Um, you don't clip as easily. Sample rate is different. Sample rate is, is really, you know, audio quality. It's like frame rate in a video. You know, the more samples shot per second, it's more frames per second. So in theory, the higher the sample rate, the smoother the audio representation will be, the more lifelike it will be. So in theory, a high sample rate is a good thing. But the problem is, is we don't listen to music at high sample rates. We listen to them at 44.1. It has to be dumped down to that at some point for MP3, for wave, whatever. Now that that is changing and probably will eventually change long, long term when you know streaming services can stream 96K at 24 bit. I mean, you know, mastered for iTunes is, is kind of future proofing that in a sense that you can have a 96k 24 bit file that they can store in 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 their archives so that um, they a they say their conversion is better uh, and b it's kind of future proofing in case we can start streaming that high fidelity they already have that in their archives which is great but really right now what we listen to is 44.1 kilohertz okay that's what it has to be mastered down to 16 bit 441 is standard audio file these days has been for many many years and so my point is, if you're going to mix at higher sample rates, just be aware that it's going to kill your CPU. You're not going to be able to mix as many plugins or as many tracks on your computer. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take up bigger file space if you're recording files like that. Uh, whether it's 48, 88.2, 96, 192, goodness gracious, any of those, it's all more data which is fine. It's more hard drive space, but it's really more processing on your computer. So if you mix at 44.1 or versus 96, it's gonna you're gonna have twice as much power if you mix at 44.1. And also, I think all the benefits of mixing at high sample rates, you kind of you chop all that off when you, when you drop back down. Now this is very controversial because a lot of people say, well, plugins sound better at, at higher sample rates, and you get that benefit, and it still translate after translates after you um, sample it back down. Uh, it, personally, I, I think that's, this is infinitesimal. So I'm the kind of guy that's like, that's not a big win for me. You lose so much in your processing power. And, and I don't know if you gain anything that I can hear, especially, definitely not anything that the, your audience can hear. You, you gain more by just getting better EQ and compression and level decisions, uh, and writing a better song. Okay. than higher sample rates. So I see a lot of people maxing out their computer at 96 K and they're like, gosh, I gotta get a new computer. I'm like, no, just mix it 44 one. Just mix a 44 one and you'll get twice as much computer power. So I'm throwing that out there, a little bit of a controversial one. If you disagree, that's fine. Leave me a comment. Let me know why you disagree in the comments below and what you like to mix at. But I say, don't make the mistake of mixing at high sample rates. Forget it. Mix at 44 one, record at 44 one. It sounds great all day long. Just focus on the things that really make the sound quality better. Mic placement, uh, performance, EQ compression, level, gain staging, all that stuff adds up to cleaner, good, better signal. So those are the three mistakes I see people making in their DAWs. If you stop making these mistakes and if you correct those two gain staging ones and then the sample rate one, I think you have a more powerful DAW, you have better sounding audio, you have better headroom, and that'll lead to just better sounding mixes in the end and better sounding masters as well, whether you master yourself or you hire somebody else. Like I said, leave me a comment below. Let me know if you've made any of these mistakes. If you disagree with any of these mistakes, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. We can get a conversation going below, help the community out. And also, if you want more strategies on how to mix, on what the big wins are for mixing, I have an entire guide on song production called my six steps to a radio ready song guide. I talk about it all the time because it really is helpful. It encapsulates the whole production process, recording, mixing, mastering. Those are just three of the six steps. It's all there for you as a roadmap when you wanna make your song sound radio worthy, sound as best as you possibly can, which I know is your goal. That's why you're watching this video. That's why I make videos every single week. But as it relates to mixing, I cover a lot of the biggest mixing hacks in that, that PDF on how I get a really good mix for the big wins. I like to go for the things that really make a big, big, big difference as opposed to all the tiny little teeny things that might make a little bit of a difference. I go for the big, big wins and it's all in that guide and it's free. Just download it at radioreadyguide.com. I'll put the link here in the video and it's in the description box below. radioreadyguide.com, simple PDF, download it, read it, check it out. You'll get all kinds of great bonus tips and tricks in that guide, and I think it'll help you out. Thanks for watching. Thanks for liking and subscribing the videos. 
I hope you have a fantastic week. And if you're watching this when this video went live, then Merry Christmas, my friend. We'll talk to you very, very soon.